Uh, welcome to Tuesday Topics. I'm Vicki Arnett, uh, President of League of Women Voters, Topeka, Shawnee County. Today we are welcoming Dr. Gianfranco Pizzino uh, as our speaker. Dr. Pizzino is Senior Fellow at Kansas Health Institute, where he focuses on the development and dissemination of best practices for the organization, financing and delivery of public health services. He directs the Center for Sharing Public Health Services, a multi-year, multi-million dollar national initiative managed by the Kansas Health Institute and funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. The center provides access to tools, techniques, expertise, and resources that support better collaboration across boundaries by public health departments, allowing them to do more together than they could do alone. In addition to his work at KHI, Dr. Pizzino also formally served as the Shawnee County Health Officer. Prior to joining KHI, Dr. Pizzino most recently served as State Epidemi Epidemiologist and Medical Director for the bioterrorism program within the Kansas Department of Health and Environment. Dr. Pizzino earned a medical degree magna cum laude at the University of Bologna, Italy, and a master's degree in public health at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. He is a fellow of the American College of Preventive Medicine, is board certified in preventive medicine and public health, and is certified in evaluation practice from George Washington University. Welcome, Dr. Pizzino. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much for the nice introduction. I hope you can all see my slides at this point. If not, interrupt me. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Uh, um, you heard everything that you need to know and much more uh, about myself. So I'm gonna move straight into our program. What I want to do in the next 30 to 40 minutes uh, is getting an overview first of how public health works, because I think I, I don't want to turn this into a lecture on uh, public health administration, but I think it is important to have an idea of the context before we talk about uh, uh, the pandemic and the challenges that the pandemic has presented and is presented and is going to present unless we change or, or adjust some of the contextual uh, elements. Uh, we will talk about the pandemic and what we learned uh, so far, and then some ideas about how we can move forward and improve the system as a whole. If you look at public health, uh, uh, you will find a variety of different definitions. And uh, uh, in, in the most common collective narrative, I think probably also for many of you, public health has been synonymous of healthcare for the poor. But I can guarantee you that nothing could be farther from the truth. The public health does, in some cases, still provide healthcare for the poor, although I would say it's becoming less and less common. And, and that is not um, the main focus of public health. It's really uh, the broadest definition that you could use is what we do together as a society to assure the condition in which everyone can be healthy. Two key elements if you want to understand public health are prevention and population health. Prevention means we want to prevent problems from happening and population health means we want to remove the barriers for people to be happy at the population level and not one person at the time. And with that in mind, as you can imagine, public health becomes a very complex system. And uh, uh, obviously I'm not going to explain this slide, but I just want to show you that if you start plugging on a chart all the different agencies and, and uh, entities that are involved in delivering public health systems, broadly defined as I have defined a moment ago, the thing becomes messy very quickly. But for the sake of this particular presentation, we will focus primarily on government and public health, public health services offered by government agencies. And if this was a face-to-face -face presentation, at this point, I will ask how many of you, by raising your hand, think that this is true? 
that the Federal Center for Disease Control in Atlanta is responsible to provide public health services throughout the country. Uh, since we can't do that, I will give you the answer, and the answer is uh, a resounding no, this is not true. The CDC is not in charge of public health, nor is any other federal entity in uh, this country. Uh, the government public health system in this country is a delicate and complex interaction of uh, federal, state, and local authorities. And let me explain uh, quickly what that means. Obviously, the federal government does have a role. When I say the CDC is not in charge, what I mean is that they cannot direct states or local health departments about what to do. But they have a lot of resources, by all means. They have money, they have technical assistance, they have the most advanced laboratories, the CDC, the NIH, and they have an emergency response infrastructure. Um, so clearly, some planning and response functions are more efficient when they are centralized. And keep this concept in mind when we talked about, uh, when we will talk in a moment about uh, um, some of the limitations of the current approach to the pandemic. But the planning and, and uh, coordination function for the federal government is not only appropriate, but very necessary. However, there is this thing called the 10th Amendment of the US Constitution that says the powers not delegating to the United States by the Constitution, United States meaning the federal government, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. And nowhere in the US Constitution there is a mention of public health. So by default, public health is a function that is passed down to the states and from and through the state to the local level. Um, so what's the role of the states? States are the default authority the broad default authority for public health. They can conduct surveillance uh, and they have the authority to impose isolation quarantine and they have what we call the police power, public health police power. They also have some technical assistance in advance capacity, just like the federal level, although in most cases, not, not, not that much. And uh, they also have some preparedness response planning functions, for example, a National Guard. But in many states, partial funding, and, and they provide in many states partial funding for local public health services. Sometimes these are federal funds that pass through the state to the locals, and sometimes they come directly from state funds. I can tell you in Kansas, most funds administered by the states are federal, and there is very little component of state money that goes directly to public health functions. So we get then to the local level. And uh, that's where the concept of home ruling and decentralization become really critical. What that means is that in decentralized states, of which Kansas is one, um, the services are going to provide as close as possible to where people live. Um, you may be uh, familiar with the concept, similar concept that happens with school districts, right? Uh, there is a state uh, board of education but schools are not administered by the Board of Education. Board of Education provides general guidelines, set standards, testing, uh, standards, and so on. But then it's up to each school board to decide how to do that, how to run their schools. And, and school boards are very local entities. Public health is a little bit of the same concept. And local health departments have a primary responsibility to recognize and manage public health priorities and also to respond to emergencies. So that's a system uh, at the very high level. Uh, you know, I could talk about the role of private nonprofit entities, federal qualified health centers, but let's leave it there for now. How does it work? And let's take an example, the current pandemic, to see what worked and what didn't work in that case. Um, I want to start with a quick timeline, review the timeline to remind everybody some key dates, because the dates are important in this case. It was January the 7th when China reported the first cluster associated with this novel coronavirus. Although now in retrospect, we know that that virus had been circulated in, in uh, China uh, since December. And that's why, by the way, it's called now the disease caused by this virus called COVID-19 because the disease first appeared at the end of December of 2019. 
but the cluster itself, the epidemic associated with the virus were reported on January the 7th. On the 21st, so just about two weeks later, the first case was reported in the United States. And again, we found out later that the virus probably had been in the United States for many weeks before detection. So first flag here, why was the virus circulating for weeks before we found it? Remember the issues of public health and the surveillance being done at the local and the state, the federal level. In some cases, it's a little unclear who's in charge of doing these things. And, and clearly the surveillance in this case, one could argue was less than ideal because it took weeks before the virus was recognized and reported. So January 21st, anyway, for better or for worse, is the date of the first reported case. In the following days, the world watched in disbelief while things in China deteriorated very quickly. And uh, for the first time in modern history, China imposed a curfew and a lockdown on uh, uh, Wuhan, a city of 11 million people. Now, let this sink in for a moment. 11 million people, that's a lot. And these people all of a sudden were in total lockdown. Who could have known? Who could have expected something like that? How many of you have heard that? Again, I would probably see many hands going up if it was in an actual room. And my answer when I hear that, well, first of all, my first reaction is anger. And my, my answer then is uh, anybody who was listening could have known. Everybody would listen to what public health was saying. And I pulled out just two examples. It took me five minutes of search in my archive of uh, instances in which for decades we had been preaching to anyone who would listen that we were way overdue for a pandemic. That much we knew. What we didn't know was exactly when where and what kind of virus or, or, or biological agent it would be. But we knew that we had to be ready. And uh, we knew that back in the early 2000s and even going back to the 1900s, 1990s. So public health knew. Problem is that not many other people listened to that. So fast forward now to our days. And uh, um, as I said, the first case was in January in the United States. And uh, of course, we went on full alert here in Kansas, like in all other states. Um, I, I, as a health officer, went in front of the Board of County Commissioners, and I was trying to strike a message that would combine, uh, we need to be careful, we need to be vigilant. We will see this virus here, just a matter of time and we need to be prepared. But there is no reason to panic at this point. There is no reason to uh, um, overreact to a situation that is potentially gonna be serious, but we are getting ready for it. We watched the cases arriving in Kansas and moving in Kansas from east to west, first in Johnson County and then in Wyandotte County, um, and things, I have to tell you, you may have noticed that, but during the pandemic, things move really fast. So remember I said the first case in Kansas was on the 7th. We still did not have any case here in uh, Shawnee County, but we knew how the virus was transmitted. And we knew that close contact and crowding were definitely two key elements. So on March the 12th, we canceled a state tournament that was scheduled to take place in Topeka. And uh, uh, that was a difficult decision. It was the first time that anything like that had been done in recent history in Shawnee County. Um, we took a lot of heat for doing that. We got some irate calls from parents claiming that we had ruined the lives of their children. I'm not exaggerating. And uh, don't get me started about how much people can react to uh, uh, public health message with their right to play sports or their kids to play sports. But definitely they thought that it was unnecessary, abusive, and they didn't like it. But a lot of other people supported us. People were starting to get concerned. So it was on the 12th. The day after we closed the schools and we had uh, a press conference 
And I remember the reporter, Tim Rancher from the Capital Journal asked me, Doctor, do you know when is the last time the Shawnee County did that, closing school for public health reasons? And got my surprise, I say, oh gosh, Tim, I, I don't remember. I've been here for 14 years, I remember. I said, I will tell you, Tim is an historian besides a reporter. He said it was 1918. So over a century ago, and it was in the middle of the pandemic, the influenza pandemic. Now, you may ask why we closed the schools at the time without going into too many details. We did not have any cases and we were not terribly concerned at the point that the schools could transmit the case themselves, but we knew that that was the end of spring break. And people had traveled um, throughout the country and we did not want to have thousands of students and staff coming back into our schools all at once from different states and bringing the virus back home. So we closed the schools for two weeks. A couple of days later, the state ordered all schools closed for the rest of the school year. We used the time before we had any cases here in Shawnee County to become more prepared. And that was really the main purpose is to gain time for the hospitals to prepare for the worst and hope for the best and for different agencies to start coordinating better with each other. And I have to tell you, the level of coordination between the city, the county, and public health and public private businesses at that time was unbelievable. I never seen anything like that. Uh, mayor was with us in daily press conferences. Uh, 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 the city manager was with us. At least the county commissioner would show up. I mean, it was really an incredible showing of support and unity. Support and unity. Please remember these words when we talk about what happened in the last few months. On March 19, we adopted the first limit for mass gatherings, and we restricted activities for bars and restaurants. We essentially closed them down with the exception of takeout and uh, curb service. Also the Board of County Commissioners declared the state of local disaster. This is the most important key date here, March 21st, my last haircut. And let me tell you why that's important. At that time, on the 19th, we had imposed some limits to mass gatherings, but private business were still operating. And that includes barbers and hairdressers and said that there were no restrictions for those businesses to operate. Problem is that many of those businesses were starting to close um, because people were afraid, because business owners and employees were afraid. And uh, there is an important lesson there, that the economy was starting to suffer above and beyond what public health was doing. It wasn't public health that was damaging those businesses in this case. It was the fear of the virus and the fact that people did not want to take any risk. So on the 21st, essentially, I, I think that was the last day that in Topeka there was one uh, barber open in the entire town and uh, they closed a couple of days later. Finally, on the 24th, we kept watching, um, you know, these cases moving and people were asking us, what's taking you so long? Why, you know, Douglas County had a safer at home order and uh, Kansas City era. And we kept saying, we are not there yet. We are not there. We don't have any case in Shawnee County. And we don't think there is a virus circulating in Shawnee County. It does no good to ask people to stay home when there is little or no virus circulating. Finally, for you know, several reasons, the 24th, we decided based on the data we had available at that time, that it was time to stay at home. And uh, I remember we opened that press conference by me saying, the time has come. And the reason that that sentence made sense to people is because we had prepared them. We have been telling them for weeks. We don't know, but we suspect we are gonna need to do that and we'll try to put it off as long as we can, but don't be surprised. And most people were actually not surprised. Our timing was impeccable. The day after our order, the first three cases were reported, two of which had a history of travel, so we knew where, or we suspected where they acquired their infection. The third did not. So there was an indication that at that point, the virus was circulating in uh, our community. So what did we do at that point? 
was following the data, right? People were asking us to take stricter measures and we didn't feel that we didn't think that we had the data to support that. When we did get the data, we took those measures that were required. Um, let me interrupt for a moment the timeline and uh, show you a little bit how we track the spread of this virus. So now we know that, you know, starting on this date in March, we had the virus in the county. What did we do? How do we track the virus? There are several ways to do that. One, of course, we count the number of cases reported. Um, we also set up uh, a, a dashboard uh, on the Shawnee County Health uh, Department website that contains different pieces of information. I don't have time to go through all the different pieces, but there is a lot of information there. And we were really proud because we were one of the first counties in Kansas who set up anything like this. And now most at least large and medium-sized counties have something similar to that. But we've always been very transparent. We always believe in data guiding our actions. And uh, that's what we wanted to, to share and disclose to the public. Um, based on our tracking, that's the curve of number of cases by date of diagnosis. And again, I could spend half an hour just telling you why cases went up and down or here and there. We don't have time for that, but just uh, uh, one uh, uh, little element. Uh, uh, this data is a couple of weeks old. It does not reflect what happened uh, after Christmas. That information will be made available on Thursday. But there isn't a single holiday on this chart. And again, I'm, 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 you, may, you probably have to take my word for that. There isn't a single holiday in this chart that was not followed by an increase in the number of cases. So yet another demonstration that how people behave and gather was extremely important in determining the trends of this outbreak. This is not an equal opportunity condition. And uh, I'm gonna show you just one slide to, to, to demonstrate that um, the percentage of our cases with a Hispanic or Latino heritage is 16%. While we have about 12% of the population that uh, identify themselves as Hispanic in our community. I also want to point out that for 15%, we do not know what their ethnicity is. And that reflects the fact that uh, um, with so many cases like we are having now, 1,000, 1,053, 1,058, there is no way we can follow them up one by one. So the percentage of people for whom we do not have this information is growing, unfortunately. That, that, that makes it difficult for us to target the right interventions for the right groups. In terms of age, since March, you can see here, uh, mortality is definitely higher in older ages, but uh, uh, the, the, the frequency of reported cases is higher for the middle age groups, age 25 to 65, that's where we see the most cases. A lot of these people work, a lot of these people did not have the luxury to stay home during the uh, uh, safer at home uh, order. There were people involved in essential services, and so they, they had to take the risk, and many of them became sick. Um, this is number of deaths by month. And November was a terrible month, terrible month. That's also when you may remember many of our hospitals were over capacity. Um, that was the result of uh, an outbreak that started affecting all our nursing homes in October and November. And there is a couple of weeks delayed from the, 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 the spike in number of cases to the time you see they're reflected in hospitalizations and deaths. And this is what this chart uh, shows. 96 deaths in a month, just for Topeka Shawnee County is a lot of people to lose. This is a, our a weekly scorecard that we use to monitor uh, the impact of the infection uh, uh, in the community. And there are six elements that are uh, uh, included in the scorecard. And then we have a summary index score. Um, depending on the score, we classify our uh, transmission into four categories from low, the green area, to red, uncontrolled. 
we have been in the red area, I believe, for six weeks in a row. And uh, the next scorecard will be released on Thursday. And at this point, I have no reason to believe that we will exit the red area this week. But after the safer at home, so go back to our timeline. After that safer at home order was lifted in May, we started the uh, reopening phase. And this is the plan that the state put together. Uh, remember that still when the governor and the state had a pretty centralized approach to this. And uh, so they decided when we would move to phase one, to phase two, three, and four, and each phase had uh, a little greater, greater element of uh, uh, relaxation of the measures. Local health departments or local health officers like me did not have at that time in May the authority to overrule the state. So I could have done, and I did that in a couple of instances, for example, if I didn't feel that we were ready to move to phase two, I could say, well, these particular elements of phase two, we are not gonna do it in Shawnee County. We are still gonna keep stricter conditions and precautions. Remember, each phase is more relaxed. But I did not, nobody had the authority in Shawnee County to say, no, you know what, well, we should go in phase out because we don't think the phase one or phase two apply to Shawnee County. They changed quickly. People started to be divided. Um, this is taken from a, a, you know, a listing, a summary of opinions from the Capital Journal in the same day. Somebody was saying, what is the point of having a county health office? No one is uh, going, Gling is going to listen to him. And someone else saying, Pizzino doesn't know any more than the rest of us. And so when you have people at these two extreme, it's really easy to see a big division in our community. Um, that division was reflected in uh, people starting to object to what public health was trying to do, was doing actually, and uh, to the containment measures taken at uh, um, the community level. So we went from being the stars to being the enemies. And I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not using these terms uh, in an exaggerated way. I have to tell you that for many people, public health became the enemy. For many others, they didn't. Now we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, but especially in smaller communities in Kansas and elsewhere, they were health officers harassed. They were uh, health officers who had to request security detail because they were afraid for their safety or the safety of uh, their families. Um, there were all sorts of ugly things going on. And uh, this made national uh, news. And, you know, this, this is uh, on the right is an ABC News article where um, there is a report about the last uh, Board of County Commissioners meeting that I attended where I announced my immediate resignation and they made national news. Um, that element of division is something that, uh, of course, the legislature at the state level took notice. And, uh, uh, you know, that can become a discussion about the chicken and the egg, what comes first. I would argue that what the legislature did incentivized division. Um, I'm sure that many legislators would tell you that they were simply reflecting the mood and the opinions of their constituents, especially those in uh, small rural communities. But for whatever reasoning, in June 2020, when the governor called a special session, um, the legislature approved overwhelmingly a House bill called House Bill 2016 that made it easier, among other things, for the Board of County Commissioners to overrule the health officers and to opt out of state containment measures. It also prevented the governor from imposing restrictions on private businesses. And there were many other conditions there. It was really a game changer. Uh, things that in public health we had taken for granted, including our ability to issue orders, something that we have used very partially and very cautiously and very rarely in the past, they became much more complicated in the middle of a pandemic. And uh, 
when you are in the middle of a crisis like ours, that's not the right time to change the rules of the game. And it was not the right time. And what followed was mass confusion, it was having 105 counties going each on their own direction. And in most cases, paying very little attention to what their health officers was telling them was necessary to do. So the Board of Health, Board of County Commissioners got the authority to overrule the health officer. And in Shawnee County, they used that authority first time on August 13. The first time I was overruled. Um, and it was again allowing bars and restaurants to be open later. Um, that was only the first time. After that time, uh, uh, the Shawnee County Board overruled the orders issued by me. And when I say by me, please understand, those are not things that I get up in the morning and decide, I'm going to let the restaurants close at 10 o'clock, no later than that, because that's what I think is right. First of all, there is a lot of data that supports those decisions. Second, there are group decisions. There are team decisions where the health officer obviously has the authority and finally take the responsibility for the decision, but the entire team was involved in those decisions. But for better or for worse, the order is signed by the health officer and now the county, the board of uh, county commission has had the authority to overrule those orders. And finally, the last time that they overruled me was on December 14, when once again, they decided that they would not extend uh, the previous order that was in place and uh, they would allow bars and restaurants again to stay open longer. Um, remember the chart I show you, that's when we were still having more than a thousand cases a week. Bad time, really bad time to relax our restrictions. So at that point, I had already announced my resignation for the end of the month and I decided that uh, the time had come for me to just step away immediately because I didn't consider it an appropriate action from the county to uh, make this kind of changes based simply on opinions and not on facts and data. Um, I announced my resignation and uh, I told you there was opposition and uh, division in the community, but I also want to point out that there were a lot of people who were supporting what public health was doing. Problem is many of those people were not very vocal. But, uh, uh, and, you know, most of you live in this community. You, 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 I'm sure you heard the reactions to my announcement as a response to the decision of the board uh, of county commissioners and the level of support that we have received since that day, on December 14, has left me really astonished. This was posted uh, um, five days after this was posted the day of my resignation. I posted on Facebook. And then five days, I took a snapshot, the reactions. There were 268 comments. And only two of them were negative. All the others were in support of, of, of public health and highly critical of uh, the decision of the board. 860 shares. You know, I'm not a very popular guy on social media. I, I, I never get the level of attention. And this time I did. Um, I received uh, probably about a hundred cards in the mail and probably a couple of hundred emails directly from people um, thanking me for my service and thanking public care for what they were doing. So the division is real. The problem is that most of the time, at least in Shawnee County, what we hear are the loud voices of those that do not like what public care was trying to do rather than the voices of those who were in support of it. Um, this is just an example. These were the most popular letters to the editor about two weeks ago. And uh, uh, four out of six were letters criticizing the action of the board. We got national attention. Uh, my two minutes of national uh, celebrity were in the uh, Chris Cuomo primetime show on CNN where Myself and uh, Dr. Jen, uh, Jennifer uh, Bacani from Wilson County uh, were uh, um, guests in the show talking about our challenges in our own communities, uh, dealing with all the div political divisions. So 
Now let's wrap this up and reflect on what happened and see how we can move forward. There are many lessons that we have learned, but these are probably those that come to the top in my mind. First of all, collaborations were vital. I told you already how critical that collaboration was between county and city. I didn't mention collaboration with the schools, but that's another one it, I, I, I am very proud of because we work very hard. We work very hard starting in July when people weren't even thinking about reopening schools. We reached out to our schools and we started to have weekly meetings and those meetings became uh, extremely important. We had for weeks and weeks, and they're continuing by the way, even after I left, we had the school superintendents themselves, not a delegate, personally attending an hour meeting every Wednesday morning to discuss with public health the best approach to reopening their schools in a safe way. So big collaborations pay off. Data-driven decisions are critical. Opinions are not data. And people can have all the opinions that they want. People can think, you know, it's not a big deal if we let bars open for a couple of extra hours. That's your opinion. That's fine. I respect that. I can have a different opinion, but most of all, when I make those decisions, I look at the data and the data tells me that it can make a difference if we let bars stay open for more, two hours more than before. Um, however, opinions can count. They can affect the outcomes in a polarized environment like ours. That's a big lesson, that's a big lesson learned the hard way. And those opinions were heard by our county commissioners and clearly they got more weight than our data. But if we had acted based only on emotions, we would have overreacted at the beginning when people were asking us to shut down our community too early, or we could have underreacted more recently where people were sick and tired and wanted to pretend that nothing was happening while we were having hospitals at 110% capacity and 90 or 100 people a month dying in the county from COVID. We must devote attention to communications. And frankly, that's perhaps uh, one of the weak points in our response in uh, certainly Shawnee County, but I would say probably statewide. Uh, um, um, I don't think we, we paid enough attention to uh, having a, a carefully crafted communications plan. They could include reassurance, build trust, truth and clarity and consistency clarity and consistency. And uh, it's so hard to achieve those two, especially consistency when you have a divided environment and a polarized environment and clarity also when you have uh, um, recommendations that change because of what we learn month after month. What reassures people we have learned is a measured steady pace, telling them what they can anticipate telling them what's coming up, telling them what we know and what we don't know, and showing them that we are moving slowly, but based on our data. I think that that's been our strongest uh, strength, our greatest strength is the fact that to the extent that we were allowed to do that, we made data-driven decisions. Uh, we had a leading team that was nationally recognized with more than 120 years of collective experience. Uh, Dusty Nichols is a, still an incident, com incident commander. Um, he is a nationally renowned person. I, I have had national recognition in uh, uh, several instances and uh, uh, Linda Oaks, the director of the health department, same thing. We were able to build this team and build on each other's skills and knowledge. And that's extremely important. Um, Dusty and Linda knew me from before and they knew that I had been preparing for something like this for 30 years. And so they follow my advice when it came to understanding the data, surveillance and technical decisions. I don't know how to manage an emergency. Dusty knows. And so I followed his advice when it came to, you know, putting documents together and recommendations, specific businesses and so on. We really built strong 
partnerships with the city county business community by using our own individual skills. We have many challenges, but you know, let me show you just the most important one. Politicization of public health is definitely at the top. When uh, wearing a mask becomes a political badge instead of the simplest public health measure that has been used for centuries, then we have a problem that is a hundred times more difficult to tackle. A national catastrophe requires a national strategy. And that level of centralization of leadership was not there. And it's still not there at the federal level. And I would argue in part at the state level, in part because of that House Bill 2016, counties have been given a lot of latitude and the state administration has been uh, eviscerated of its ability to set a statewide strategy and standards on how to move with this uh, pandemic. Um, the last thing I want to mention is the virus fatigue. Man, we're all tired. Who is not tired here? Uh, we are tired physically. Those of us directly involved in the response are very tired physically and emotionally. But everybody is tired of this virus. Who is now? Who does not want to go back to our lives? But remember my last haircut? The reason that was my last one is not because of what public health did. It's because we had the virus. The economic consequences, the consequences on our lifestyle, the consequences on the quality of lives of this pandemic are not the result of what public health has done, are the result of a viral pandemic. Public health has done its best to mitigate those consequences using the best data available. And that's something that is often lost in some people's mind is that they see, you can see the virus. My good colleague, Jen, the one who was on the CNN show has this great analogy say they can see the virus so they turn to the enemy that they can see. And that's a public health officer that tells them they can't go to the bar and the restaurant or their kids cannot play sports. Final show, moving forward. First of all, you heard here first, there will be another pandemic. I cannot tell you when, for some of us may not be during our life span, but it's not gonna be another thousand years. It's not gonna be another hundred years, I don't think. It's going to be in decades or a few years. Um, so we need to be ready to respond. And uh, the current system, as it is set up now, has several weaknesses that need to be addressed. And again, that could be the subject of an entire presentation on its own. But I want to point out two particular elements. One is the governance. Who is in charge? There has to be a clear sense about who is in charge to do what. And when the ball, when the bucket is passed down the line over and over and over and over and over again until it reaches the hands of, uh, you know, three county commissioners in a rural area who have no clue about health and public health, who ran for office based on interest on, uh, you know, agriculture, because maybe they're, they're, they're involved, they're former farmers or something. And the first day of work, they were told, oh, by the way, you're also a member of the Board of Health. That is not the right place to make those decisions. And I think it's time to consider for Kansas something that has been done in other states, which is the fact that there should be separate boards of health that make those decisions. They can be accountable to the Board of County Commissioners. I don't want to create you know, a, a vacuum of public health actions there, but they should include primarily people with technical skills and not to leave those decisions in the hands of people who do not have the kind of skills and trainings. So that's the first element, who's in charge and the governance. The second element is the fragmentation. Uh, those of you who do not fall asleep during the boring, a very nice and kind introduction about who I am and what I do. Maybe you heard that uh, uh, I, I lead this national project about sharing resources among health departments. And, and, and uh, the main issue there is we have fragmentation. We have about 3,000 health departments in this country. 
and 100 in Kansas with 105 counties. So that tells you that almost every county in Kansas has its own health department. Do we need that? Is that the most efficient way to deliver public health services? I would argue that it's not. And so we need to find incentives to share resources and programs among different jurisdictions so that those health services and those responses to public health emergencies can uh, uh, be ramped up more efficiently and effect effectively. Uh, the final, very final slide, the uh, word of hope. Vaccine arrives in Kansas. Um, I cannot overestimate and overstate the importance of this step and what a marvelous achievement this has been. When I say that he, we, we have been training for 30 years for this, we never counted on a vaccine being developed in uh, less than a year. In fact, we were thinking more in the two to five year time frame. It's an incredible success in technology, in, in, in uh, uh, medical technology, something we should not underestimate. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. The light is the vaccine. But uh, we are still in the tunnel. We are way in the middle of the tunnel. So just because we see the light at the end, it's not a good reason for us to drop all our precautions and start running. We are in the dark of that tunnel. If we start running now, we will trip and fall. So we need to move at a steady pace, slowly, monitor our data and doing what our data will um, allow us to do. Uh, that's all I have. I hope we have a few questions, time for a few questions. So um, we do have a time for a few questions. Um, uh, and just a reminder, put your questions in the chat box. We do have a really high attendance today. So, um, and if you can direct them to Carol Jordan, uh, that would be helpful. Uh, but let me kind of start this off, Dr. Pizzino, with asking, since our league does have um, a platform uh, to communicate with the public through our mini grant from the Kansas Leadership Center, um, what kind of messages do you think are important to um, move out at this point? Um, well, there is a more generic message that I would say is uh, pay attention to what public health tells you to do. And there is a more specific message that is applicable to the current situation, which is stay away from people. Just stay away from people. We know how this virus is transmitted. And uh, uh, the spike that we have experienced in the last couple of months is not due to mass events where you had thousands of people going all together all at the same time at that event. It's more the small informal gatherings. It's um, the bars. It's uh, the family gatherings around the holidays, that kind of situation. Uh, I know we are all tired but we need to be patient a few more months until the vaccine can be deployed on a broader scale and just create your own social bubble with a few, as few people as possible and stick to that. Okay, thank you, Dr. Pizzino. Thank you, Vicki. We have a few questions. Uh, first one uh, from Kim. Uh, harkens back to the pie chart somewhere in the middle. Why is it that 15% of those being tracked are unknown? as to race and ethnicity, who tracks, how are cases tracked, and is it consistent? Uh, the reason why that's unknown, if I had time, I could have shown you the, the, the evolution of the number from the beginning of the outbreak until now. Uh, that information has to be collected during a case interview. So we get the report of each case based on laboratory reports, okay? And that's an automated, process. Virtually all the laboratories in the country report electronically into the state disease reporting system, electronic disease reporting system, and then we can pull out the reports for Kansas. So we know how many cases we have, and we know very basic information, typically name and date of birth. In some case, we have an address, but we don't know anything else. 
So if you want to know more information like race, ethnicity, where did you go in the past 14 days and uh, who are your close contacts, we need to call these people and talk to them. And two things have changed in the, the past few months. Number one, the number of cases we receive every week far exceeds our ability to reach everybody. And so in fact, I, I didn't check recently, but last time I checked a few weeks ago, we were talking to about 30% of our cases. The rest were not even called by public health, which is very depressing. Number two, one of the things that, that House Bill 2016 has done is um, uh, giving people more ability to uh, not work with public health. Um, obviously, the answer to those questions has always been uh, voluntary, right? I mean, we don't send a chef department to somebody's house to know where, they, you know, where they have been two weeks ago. Um, but that house bill forced anybody who calls to do an investigation or somebody reported as a positive case to first disclose, oh, by the way, your answer is totally voluntary. And uh, um, if you don't want to talk to me, it's just fine. Do you want to talk to me? The, the number of people said no increased dramatically after that provision was, was put in place. So, you know, back to, to the previous question, I should probably have mentioned that, uh, hoping I'm not getting in trouble for lobbying, but uh, um, here is one thing as an organization you may want to think about is taking a serious look at House Bill 2016 and have a serious conversation with people who know public health and uh, work with legislators on changes. The legislature has to review the bill. I believe the bill expires actually um, third week in January, if I'm not mistaken. So one of the first things they have to do is to review it and decide what to do with the bill. This is the time to let people know that the consequences of the bill have been nothing but disastrous. Thank you. Next question. Um, this individual heard an article on public radio that Kansas had lost 25% of its public health workers just since March. What effect is this going to have on our state now and going forward? It's, 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 uh, it's a terrible thing because remember the collective experience I was showing you earlier? Um, many of the people who left are people like me, people with decades of experience in public health. And uh, uh, there isn't exactly a line of people waiting outside the door who want to come in and get and take those uh, places that have been vacated now. So I think it's something that we will, uh, for which we will pay a price for many, many years to come. We need to train more people. We need to make it more um, attractive to work in public health. We need to pay people more. And I'm not talking for the health officer. I'm talking for the people. Who are, I, I was never hired by the health department. I just had a contract with them, but talking about the people who make a career in the public health agency. And we need to work on our workforce training. Uh, Kansas does not have a school of public health. It's one of the very few states without a school of public health. We have master's programs, but not a full school of public health. Um, so uh, the consequence of that turnover is something that we will struggle with for many, many years to come. Thank you. Next question. Should everyone get a COVID-19 test whether or not they have symptoms? I am asking because you have not, you may not have COVID-19 when you test, but then later you might have it and test positive. Right, right. Um, you know, uh, intelligent, reasonable people may have different opinions on this. I will tell you what my opinion is. Based primarily on data, um, I'm not a strong fan of people without symptoms being tested unless there is another specific reason. Um, as far as I know, I'll give you my example. As far as I know, I've not had any exposure to COVID in the last 14 days. For me to get up today and go to one of the testing centers and get a test done, who, who is helped by that? What is the result of that? Peace of mind? No, because just as you said in your question, I may not show a positive test today, but if I were infected, maybe I will show a positive test in two days or three days from now. So unless 
testing asymptomatic people is part of a general program where say you screen everybody in a school or you screen everybody in a nursing home uh, once a week or every other week. Then for people like, you know, majority of people in this audience today to go and seek a test, if they have no exposure that is known and they have no symptoms, I think serves really no purpose. It's just a waste of time and resources. Thank you. Um, I, I think uh, this questioner, Ms. Prentice speaks for a lot of us saying uh, you have a great resume and your work experience and you care about humanity. We want to thank you for caring all the good work you've done throughout your life. And here in Shawnee County, uh, uh, she and many of the rest of us have followed your advice and not gotten COVID. Our question is, how will you continue your quest for public health in the future? Uh, will I continue? Is that a question? About yeah, me? what are you going to do next? I think. Well, first of all, uh, uh, that was a loss of many people during the pandemic because I was always in the front line as a health officer. But I do have a full-time job beyond being a health officer. Being the health officer was supposed to be a kind of side uh, element that, that, that I was doing, but I am employed by the Kansas Health Institute and my employer has been extremely gracious in uh, allowing me flexibility in the past few months to dedicate definitely more time that I should have just based on contractual requirements to be the health officer. So the first thing I'm gonna do, I'm, I'm, I'm going to fulfill my obligations to my employer with the Kansas Health Institute. Well, I'm also trying to stay uh, engaged. I, I'm, uh, um, you know, I'm talking to people. I, I, I'm thinking about ways for, uh, uh, to share my opinions, to share my assessments of the situation with broader audiences. I can't tell you exactly what form they will take if, you know, regular columns on uh, media outlets or, uh, you know, a blog or whatever it is. And uh, a lot of people have my cell phone numbers. If they have questions, I hope they will still call me whether I'm the health officer or not. Thank you uh, so much, Dr. Brazino. We have a lot of other questions, but we don't have a lot of other time. So I'm going to give this back to President Vicki. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I do want, uh, Dr. Pizzino, that um, without objections, the league stands virtually in an expression of gratitude to Dr. Pizzino for your years of service uh, for a standing ovation. So as we're able, um, we're going to give this our best virtual thought shot. So um Thank, Thank you, you so much, um, and uh, we, we would welcome your return to our Local League Tuesday topics. Thank you so much for being here. Thank uh, you. I appreciate it. Certainly. I, um, I do want to remind everybody to, re to join us back here on, at Tuesday Topics. Tuesday, February the 2nd, our speaker will be Dr. Amber Dickinson, Assistant prof Professor of political science at Washburn University. She'll be discussing redistricting in Kansas. So thank you, have a good rest of your day.